Good morning. Let us now uh, begin our discussion of a very important uh, playwright post-independence, uh, Vijay Tendulkar. Uh, and the first play we'll be discussing by him is called Silence the Court is in Session, uh, Shantata Ch Court Chalu Ahe, which is the Marathi title. And it's a 1967 production. And it's one of the first Tendulkar plays that became uh, a part of the new Indian drama phenomenon of the 1960s. And it's also one of the first modern Indian plays where uh, the woman, the female protagonist of the play, becomes the protagonist and the uh, victim of the play. And uh, what is also interesting is that the play uh, takes the form of a play within a play. Right? So you have an outer play, an outer narrative frame, and you have a play that is being enacted inside the play, within the larger structure of the framing play. And uh, the distinction between the outer play and the inner play is uh, gradually blurred and finally collapsed by the end of the play. Uh, the play itself has a rather a fairly uh, simple plot. Uh, it's about a young uh, school teacher called Miss Benare, who is uh, accused of having committed infanticide, uh, and for which the court uh, condemns her. And so there is a mock trial. The play takes a form of a mock court trial. Uh, where uh, Miss Benari is being charged with infanticide, for which she is punished, she is shamed. And uh, by the end of the play, there's actually no distinction between the outer play and the inner play. Now, the outer play is of these different characters. You have several characters in the play, all of whom uh, are uh, struggling actors. So they are actors, uh, playing actors, playing characters in the inner play. Right. So you have actors playing actors in the play and they're all trying to put up a play right in which they play different characters and uh, they're all struggling actors right and they're all part of a, a troupe that is headed by Mr. Uh, Kashigar and uh, they're all uh, struggling to put up a new performance for the uh, city and uh, uh, you have uh, Miss Benare who is one of the actors in the play who is also becomes the protagonist of the play within the play. There's an inner play. The inner play takes the form of a mock court trial where Miss Benare, the protagonist of uh, the play, uh, is being charged with infanticide. Uh, the play is, uh, you know, largely thematically speaking uh, about, you know, is a, is a condemnation, a patriarchal condemnation of women, female sexuality. And, uh, you know, uh, initially uh, there's a suggestion that Ms. Benari has done something which she should not have done, which uh, transgresses uh, social norms, uh, which is to uh, kill her unborn child. Uh, and uh, she's also then later charged for having had an affair with a much older married professor, uh, Professor Damle, uh, for which she's also being shamed and stigmatized and punished. And uh, the unborn child is Mr. is the child she has with Professor Damle, uh, so sh for which she has to be um, uh, punished. So the play really is about uh, the patriarchal regulation and uh, oppression of uh, women uh, who are unable to actually be uh, sexual, uh, independent uh, sexual agents uh, of uh, in their own uh, nature. And uh, uh, what is also part of Tendulkar's dramatic strategy in the play is to show how uh, uh, Benare's uh, persecutors in the play are actually as powerless as she is. So, in, uh, you know, so it seems to be as the editor of the collection of uh, uh, plays by Tendulkar, right? So the uh, main editor of the collected works of Tendulkar, uh, Shomik Bandhapadhyay, who is also a very important uh, playwright uh, and uh, director, says of Tendulkar's play, Silence the Court is in Session, is to say that uh, it is part of Tendulkar's dramatic strategy that Benare's immediate prosecutors or persecutors in the play are as powerless as she is. And all the exertions to cut Benare down to size are more, they are striving after power than a real exercise of power. Right. So you have uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kashigar, uh, you have a, uh, a very innocent uh, villager who, who uh, initially comes to watch the performance of the play but then becomes a part of the play, within the play, uh, uh, Samant. Uh, then uh, you also have uh, certain other characters, you have Mrs. Kashigar, right, who is uh, rather 
uh, you know, a subservient wife uh, to Mr. Kashikar. Uh, she's always being uh, ridiculed by her husband and silenced. And then uh, you also have another very uh, important characters in the play. So you have Sukatme, who is an, a rather inefficient uh, lawyer. Right. So he wants to be a proficient lawyer, but he is struggling to be one. Uh, you also have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kashikar's adopted uh, son, um, Rokade, uh, who is unable to attain uh, an independent adult existence. Uh, someone who is independent of his parents. He's always being infantilized, treated like a child in the play. And you also have another character called Karnik, who is, uh, you know, uh, trying in vain to become a successful actor. Right? And Karnik also seems to be, in some sense, a autobiographical uh, reflection of Vijay Tendulkar himself in the kinds of uh, understanding that he has of modern theatre, what theatre means to him. So these are the uh, some of the important uh, characters in the play. And uh, you will notice that as the play proceeds, uh, you know, Ms. Benare is initially the centre of uh, the attention of all the other male and female characters in the play. And uh, because she has been made the protagonist and the victim of the mock court trial in the play, uh, you know, you'll also notice that um, uh, that Miss Benare is well, well aware of uh, the insecurities of these men and women who act with her, her fellow actors. And they're all in some sense failures and they're all struggling to become what they are trying to become, what they want to become in their lives, but they're unable to. And so Miss Benare is constantly uh, ridiculing them, making fun of them as the uh, play proceeds, but then as the uh, title of the play itself suggests, silence the courts in session, uh, the court uh, becomes another oppressive patriarchal uh, institution that uh, gradually silences uh, Ms. Benare. So it becomes a uh, one of those uh, uh, institutions that um, embodies the silencing mechanisms of patriarchy that uh, uh, that uh, forbids women from uh, speaking, right, from speaking up. And so towards the end of the play, when uh, Ms. Benare actually uh, delivers a long monologue uh, to, um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, about her own uh, plight, uh, it's hardly a defense in her case because she's unable to defend herself against uh, a court, against these men who will not let her speak. So it's a rather unsuccessful uh, self-defense, which actually becomes more uh, an exploration of the lost, foregone possibilities of life itself, uh, possibilities that are no longer available to the woman in question. It's rather symbolic of uh, Vijay Tendulkar to actually portray uh, Ms. Benare, uh, the, uh, the space of the court, uh, where the mock court, uh, tr court trial takes place, as a, pa as a zone of patriarchy, uh, where uh, the woman is uh, trapped. Right? So if you look at the opening of uh, Act 1, uh, you know, there is a, a description of the space on the stage where, where uh, you have lights going up on an empty, completely empty hall and there are two doors, uh, one, one to enter by and one to go to an adjoining room. One side of the hall seems to go leftwards into the wings. Within the hall are a built-in platform, one or two old wooden chairs, an old box, a stool and sundry other things lie jumbled together as if in, as if in a lumber room. The, a clock out of order on the wall. Some worn-out portraits of national leaders, a wooden board with the names of donors, a picture of the god Ganesha hung on the door. The door is closed. Right? There are footsteps outside. Someone unlocks the door. A man sidles in and stands looking around as if seeing the hall for the first time. This is Samanth. In his hands, a lock and key, a toy parrot made of green cloth, a book. Uh, so. Uh, you see uh, this, this is a very innocent uh, villager, uh, somebody who's come to watch the performance Samanth, entering the uh, space of the theatre, which then becomes the space of the court where the mock trial takes place. And he suggests that Miss um, Benare enters later on with, uh, you know, uh, holding her finger. One of her fingertips is between her lips. Uh, she obviously has injured her uh, fingertip, uh, which got caught in the door. Uh, on, uh, to the uh, entrance of the theater and she gets uh, locked inside right and that's what someone says that shut the door and you've had it locked yourself in right so it's uh, symbolic uh, to note that uh, she gets trapped inside and then she gets trapped again towards the end of the uh, second act right so she's unable to actually get out of the space it, it becomes a trap 
And uh, through the conversation uh, between uh, Ms. Benari and Samant, uh, Benari initially seems to be a little flirtatious, is trying to get uh, Samant's attention. And uh, but Samant is, uh, you know, not aware of uh, the attentions that he's receiving from Miss Benari. He seems rather innocent. And um, later on, of course, uh, uh, Miss Benari uh, exploits Samant's innocence to actually ridicule the other characters who are yet to appear on stage. So uh, Miss Benari is, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, a school teacher, and uh, she begins by talking about how children are far better than adults. They do not have the uh, blind pride of thinking that they know everything. Uh, there's no nonsense, she says, stuffed in their heads. They don't scratch you till you bleed. They then run away like cowards. Please open that window. It's become too hot for me. So you can you can uh, notice Miss Benare. Uh, comparing children to adults, of how children are not prejudiced like adults. They are not uh, arrogant. They don't think they know everything. And uh, they do not, uh, as she says, they do not attack you. They don't attack you and then run away like cowards. Right? So they're not insecure. They're not insecure unlike adults. Hmm? Uh, so there's a certain innocence to children, a certain uh, sincerity that adults lack. And then she suggests that she has been uh, charged with um, some accusation that has completely ruins her reputation as a school teacher. Right? She says that she's been slandered right? and so she's wondering why she's been slandered when she has been a good school teacher. Uh, she says, my children will do anything for me for I'd give the last drop of my blood to teach them. That's why people are jealous, especially the, the other teachers and the management. But what can they do to me? What can they do? However hard they try, what can they do? They're holding an inquiry, if you please. But my teaching's perfect. I've put my whole life into it. I've worn myself to a shadow in, the, in this job. Just because of one bit of slander, what can they do to me? Throw me out? Let them. I haven't hurt anyone, anyone at all. Uh, if I've hurt anybody, it's been myself. But that, is that the kind of reason for throwing me out? Who are these people to say that what I can or can't do? My life is my own. I haven't sold it to anyone for a job. My will is my own. My wishes are my own. I'll do what I like with myself and my life. I'll decide. And then uh, she suddenly unconsciously places her hand on her stomach and she suddenly stops. Seeing someone, she falls silent. Gradually, she regains her poise. Someone is embarrassed. So you can make out that uh, she has something to conceal. We don't know as yet what it is, but uh, when she places her hand on her stomach, and after if you've read the entire play, then you will realize that uh, that probably the allegation is true, that probably there was a time when she did bear uh, a child. Uh, and then later we get to know that the child is Professor Damre's child. One must also pay attention to Ms. Benare's uh, poems and songs, the poems that she writes, which uh, suggest her growing knowledge of life of certain aspects of life like love and sexuality and the uh, growing uh, control and prohibitions over a young woman's movements once she comes of age right so uh, one of her english songs that she sings to herself is uh, like this um, oh i've got a sweetheart who carries all my books he plays my dollhouse and says he likes my looks i'll tell you a secret he wants to marry me but mummy says i'm too little to have such thoughts as these. Right? So mummy says I'm too little to have such thoughts as these. Right? So it's almost suggesting that um, uh, she is precocious. She's too young to know things like love, right? uh, like uh, sexual attraction. And then she uh, gradually uh, mentions uh, some of the other, other, other actors and characters who are going to act with her. And she begins ridiculing them to Samant. Uh, so she says that, uh, so our chairman, that is the uh, head of the drama troupe, our chairman Kashikar will tell you, Kashikar can't take a step without a prime objective. Besides him, there's Mrs. Hand that rocks the cradle. I mean Mrs. Kashikar. What an excellent housewife the poor woman is. A real hand that rocks the cradle type. But what's the use? Mr. Prime objective is tied up with uplifting the masses. And poor hand that rocks the cradle has no cradle to rock. Right? So she suggests that Mr. that Mr. Kashikar is a hypocrite, as someone who really 
who is uh, an idealistic uh, man who wants to uplift the masses, right? But Mrs. Kashka is someone who, uh, uh, you know, presents herself as someone who is uh, a domesticated wife and, uh, and someone who aspires to be a mother. But unfortunately, she does not have a child of her own, which is why they adopt Rokri. Someone says, uh, you mean they have no, he rocks an imaginary baby in his arms. Benare, right. You seem to be very bright too. Mr. Kashikar in the hand, the hand that rocks the cradle, in order that nothing should happen to either of them in their bare, bare house, and that they shouldn't die of boredom, gave shelter to a young boy. And so Ms. Benare suggests the hollowness of their marriage, the boredom of their marriage, the lovelessness of their marriage, and the fact that they need, a, need, they need to shelter, they need, they need to adopt a young boy in order to bring life back to their own marriage and to their own lives. They educated him, made him toil away, made a slave out of him. His name's Balu, Balu Rokri. Who else? Well, we have an expert on the law. He's such an authority on the subject. Even a desperate client wouldn't go anywhere near him. He just sits alone in the barrister's room at court, swatting flies with legal precedence. And in his tenement, he sits alone killing house flies. But for today's mock trial, he's a very great barrister. You'll see the wonder he performs. And there's a hmm with us. Hmm, scientist interfered. Right? So she first makes fun of Balu Rokre, who is the adoptive son of Mr. and Mrs. Kashigar, who wants to pro project himself as an expert lawyer. Then you have uh, a scientist, an, or an aspiring scientist, who has failed his intermediate, uh, Sukhatme. She says, we have an intellectual too. That means someone who prides himself on his book learning. But when there's a real life problem, away he runs hides his head. He's not here today, he won't be coming either, he wouldn't dare, right? So he's again, he's talking about Karnik, so who um, prides himself on book learning, and but he's so bookish that when there's a real life problem, he does not know how to handle it. So there's a, there's a gap between his, um, uh, you know, his theoretical uh, bookish knowledge of the world and uh, his experiences of, of life. And the initial plan is to actually um, perform a play uh, which is uh, a polemic, an attack on uh, President Johnson, uh, of the American President Johnson for producing uh, atomic weapons. And that's the initial idea. Right? But then later on, they changed the mind to actually, to uh, Ms. Benare's uh, case of infanticide, to actually make the play a lot more uh, salacious and gossipy and exciting. Uh, if you look at some of uh, Ms. Benare's other poems and songs, so, for example, she recites a poem of hers, which again suggests her uh, deep sense of uh, isolation. She says, Our feet tread upon unknown and dangerous pathways evermore. Wave after blinded wave is shattered, stormily upon the shore. Light glows alive again. Again it mingles with the dark of night. Our earthen hands burn out, and then again in flames they alight. Everything is fully known, and everything is clear to see. And the wound that's born, born to bleed, bleeds on forever, faithfully. There's a battle sometimes, where defeat is destined as, as, as the end. Some experiences are meant to taste, then just to waste and spend. Right? So her poem suggests that defeat is imminent, that she will be defeated by the end of the play. And uh, so initially, Miss Benaria seems to be someone who is filled with uh, vitality. Right? Uh, she seems to love life. Uh, she can never compromise on her life. She can never uh, grudge her own life. And she seems rather happy. She seems rather lively. But then her liveliness, uh, her sense of vitality, uh, seems to barely conceal a deep sense of hurt now that she has been accused, her reputation has been tainted, that she's been slandered for having an affair with uh, an older married man and also for having had a child with him, uh, for which uh, her, her whole career uh, as a school teacher her reputation as a school teacher is being ruined. Uh, one of the sub-themes of the play is also about uh, theatre itself, the very form and function of theatre itself. And this comes through in the dialogues between Karnik, who is, as I mentioned earlier, an autobiographical allusion to uh, Tendulkar himself, who uh, you know, is constantly making a comment on theatre. What, what is this phenomenon called modern theatre? And of course, he has a problem with uh, the way modern theatre is practiced, in the way it takes place within, a very in, within, within an enclosed, intimate space and on a raised uh, platform, on a raised uh, proscenium stage. So Katmi, for example, you know, in his very flamboyant lawyer's voice, uh, you know, makes fun of Karnik and he says, one minute, Mr. Karnik, 
Shall I tell you what's going on through your mind right now? This hall you are thinking is ideal for intimate theatre. In other words, for those plays of yours for a tiny audience, which go over their heads in any case. Yes or not? Answer me. Right. So, Sukhatmi is actually ridiculing Karnik for the kinds of plays that he seems to perform for a rather small and elite audience within an enclosed space on the proscenium arch. And so he wonders whether uh, Karnik's plays are actually being understood, can be understood by the uh, common masses, or whether they are actually abstruse and intellectual like him. And so Karnik being the aspiring intellectual, right? although I mean, which actually he actually ends up being rather pretentious intellectual by the end of the play. Uh, then Miss Benare continues to actually ridicule Mr. and Mrs. Kashkar for their uh, pretentious uh, marriage. Uh, it seems rather sentimental. Uh, you must also remember that Professor Damle never actually appears on stage. Professor Damle is never accused, I mean, never charged with anything. Uh, I mean, it's Miss Benare who has to, uh, you know, bear the the charges, the accusations of the other actors of the of the mock court trial for having uh, transgressed uh, social codes of femininity. But Miss Mr. Damle or uh, Professor Damle is never accused of having betrayed. Uh, Be Miss Benare and having abandoned her after he uh, gives her his child. There are also minor suggestions in the during the mock court trial. So, for example, there are uh, Sukhatmi, for example, ridicules the whole uh, uh, the formality uh, of the court trial. He says that uh, well, we have the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita for the oath taking. I mention it because you want something to read. By the way, Rokre. You did bring along the Bible and the Gita, didn't you? Or have you forgotten? And Rokre seems to have forgotten the uh, Bible and the Bhagavad Gita on which the oath is taken. They seem to actually have instead a rather new uh, erotic and racy uh, pulp uh, fiction novel uh, by this Marathi writer Suryakant uh, Fatafekar. And uh, Saman seems to have a copy of it. And he says that his novels are so thrilling. This is the hundred and fifth novel of his. So they claim to uh, almost use that book instead of the Gita and the Bhagavad and the Bible uh, to for the oath taking. Right. So in some sense this is also ridiculing the whole uh, formal process uh, procedure of uh, oath taking and uh, in some sense is also a parodying the very notion of, of truth itself. Like what does it mean to say the truth? Uh, who is to say the truth? Right. Uh, truth always obviously in this place seems to lie in the hands of the of those who have power and not those who uh, are powerless. So the, in fact the whole play in, self, in some sense is a, is a parody of the truth. Of it's, a, it's, a, it's, kind of, it's a satire on, uh, on, on, uh, on patriarchy and the kind of truth claims that patriarchy makes uh, in its uh, bid to actually uh, persecute women for uh, the crimes, the imaginary or real crimes that they have committed. And so uh, what is interesting is that the court has condemned uh, Ms. Benare. Uh, to infanticide even before she has uh, committed the act. It's like uh, Miss Benare is condemned from the very beginning. She's damned either way, right? So she's, uh, it, it does not, her consent uh, does not matter at all, right? So the, the very fact that she fell in love with um, a, an older married man and had a child with him is uh, enough, is sufficient grounds for society and for the court to actually damn her uh, as a uh, lose uh, disreputable woman. Right? So, so she is charged with uh, with infanticide uh, even before uh, she has actually uh, committed the act. And uh, you know, it does not matter whether whether she consented to the relationship or not, or to the affair or not. But then she is guilty. So she, so she is. So this is, of course, a classic uh, instance of uh, the structural oppression of women in uh, patriarchy. So irrespective of whether they are active agents or not, whether they actively participate, whether they have uh, they have any consent or not, uh, you know, they are damned uh, as um, potentially uh, guilty. In, in the, at the beginning of Act Two, again there is uh, another instance of you know in where, where, where the where court procedure is being ridiculed. Right. So the initial um, scene uh, of Act Two uh, goes in the different uh, actors slash characters of the play of the inner play uh, of the mock court trial uh, sharing pawn. Right. And so there's this uh, kind of rather funny uh, competition of uh, between the characters and how how quickly the characters can uh, consume pan 
and how quickly, how fast they can uh, spit pan out, right? And so there's uh, there's this whole competition on uh, on pan spitting, which uh, which takes up much of the time. And uh, Miss Benare is uh, in the who at this point in the play still has a few lines to say, uh, manages to actually uh, make fun of um, the uh, the dignity uh, of the court. Right? So she constantly come has these uh, brief uh, comebacks, uh, ridiculing. Um, the institution of the court and uh, and uh, Mr. Kashikar, who is the judge. And uh, when Mr. Kashikar uh, charges Ms. Benare with infanticide, she says, how does infanticide really work? Really, I don't like your word at all. Infanticide? Infanticide? Why don't you accuse me instead of mm, snatching public property? That has a nice sound about it, don't you think? Sounds like snacking. And then Mr. Mrs. Kashikar says, I don't think so at all. There's nothing wrong with the present charge. Benare, banging her ha hand on the chair. Order, order. The dignity of the court must be preserved at all costs. Can't shut up at home, can't shut up here. Imitating a lawyer, Milord, let the court's family be given a suitable reprimand. She's never committed the crime of infanticide or stolen any public property except for Milord himself. Right? So she's uh, imitating the lawyer and, and the judge and is actually making, uh, parodying the entire uh, court uh, proceedings. Then, of course, later initially she refutes the charges of the court. Uh, she says that I, could, I couldn't even hurt, kill a common cockroach. Why would I kill a newborn child? Right? So she, she refuses to uh, accept that she's guilty. Uh, then later on in uh, the interrogation that occurs uh, between Sukhatme, Pongshe and Ms. Benare, again, uh, they ask her what she does. She says, uh, Pongshe says that she's a teacher, a school mom. Uh, and so you gradually notice how the other male characters of the play are uh, usurping her voice. They assume Ms. Benare's voice and they, are, and they seem to answer for her. Right? So whenever she's asked a question, it's not as though she always has the opportunity to answer the questions. Her voice is always being appropriated by other characters. Then Pongshe tells uh, Sukatme, who's asking Ms. Benare the questions, she tells, uh, Pongshe seems to speak for her, saying that she's unmarried. And Pongshe says, to the public eye, she's unmarried. And Benare says, and to the private eye, Kashikar order, Ms. Benare, self-control. Don't forget the value of self-control. To Sukhatme, you may continue. I'll just be back. Then Sukhatme, uh, the lawyer, asks Mr. Pongshe, how would you describe your view of the moral conduct of the accused? On the whole, like that of a normal unmarried woman, you should at least take this trial seriously. Benare, but how should he know what the moral conduct of a normal unmarried woman is like? Pongshe, it is different. Sukhatme, for example, Pongshe, the accused is a bit too much. Sukhatme, a bit too much, what does that mean? Pongshe, it means, it means that on the whole, she runs after men too much. Benare, poor man. Sukhatme, Miss Benare, you're committing contempt of court. Benare, the court has gone into that room. So how can contempt of it be committed in this one? There's not much point in that remark, Sukhatme. Then uh, Sukhatme, there's no point in coming to grips with you. Mr. Pongshe, Pongshe is, has slid out of the witness box and is talking to Karnik. Nobody is at all as serious. Pongshe returns to the witness box. Mr. Pongshe, can you tell me, does the accused have a particularly close relationship with any married or unmarried man? Benare interrupting, yes, with the counsel for the prosecution himself and with the judge to say nothing of Pongshe, Balu here or Karnik. Right? So she is obviously making fun of the whole thing. She says that she's, she has an intimate relationship with all the men who are present in the mock trial. So this uh, mock court trial is actually a rehearsal for the play that, they, that they're going to put up that very night. But then the mock trial itself becomes a farce, right? a farce of a trial. So they're constantly trying to decipher or read uh, Ms. Benare's behavior, right? Does she embody, are there any signs on her of um, what it means to be a loose, promiscuous woman, right? Uh, especially since she's unmarried at her age. She's in her early or mid-30s and she's still not married. So which is what makes these men suspicious, wondering whether she is out to seduce and trick men. Then uh, they invite Karnik, the uh, aspiring actor, on stage to occupy the witness box. Then they again interrogate Karnik, asking him how much he knows or what he knows of Miss Benare. And again, he talks about the modern play. Again, he makes certain comments on modern plays. Sukhatme wants to know what 
is the description of a mother in the plays that Karnik performs. And Karnik says the life that uh, the new plays don't mention them at all. They are they're actually about the futility of life. On the whole, that's all man's life is. So in some sense, the court through Sukatme wants Karnik to confirm uh, that motherhood is a sacred, pure institution. Right? So it's something that all women aspire for. And all women as mothers uh, have to honor, honor their roles, uh, their socially sanctioned roles, sacred roles as mothers. Right? So they cannot question it, they cannot challenge it. And of course, the court is talking about women who are married and have a child. Right? So, so it's, uh, the court sanctifies, uh, can only sanction the uh, possibility of having a child within marriage, thereby uh, sanctifying, corroborating the uh, ideal notion of monogamy and uh, motherhood within marriage. Sukhatme, Mr. Karnik, who is the mother? The woman who protects the infant she has born or the one who cruelly strangles it to death? Which definition do you prefer? Karnik, both are mothers because both have given birth. Sukhatme, what would you call motherhood? Karnik, giving birth to a child. Sukhatme, but even a bitch gives birth to pups. Karnik, then she's a mother, of course. Who denies it? Who says only humans can be mothers and not dogs? Benare, stretching lazily. Bully for you, Karnik. Then uh, there, there is, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Rokade's turn to actually appear on uh, in the witness box and to testify against uh, Ms. Benare. And uh, Balu Rokade, who is an infantilized uh, man, somebody who is uh, rather childlike, who doesn't have an independent existence away from his adoptive parents, Mr. and Mrs. Kashigar, is unable to speak. He doesn't know what to say. And then you notice uh, how the, all the male characters are conspiring together to create uh, you know, a conspiratorial narrative against uh, that would condemn uh, Miss Benari, right? So they, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a story of patriarchy, as it were, as they, as they, as they uh, gang up uh, together against Miss Benari to confirm their suspicions uh, of um, her uh, disreputable character. And uh, Rokri, uh, now he makes it up. He says that he went to Professor Damle's house and uh, there he sees Miss Benari. And that from this point onwards, uh, Miss Benari uh, speaks less and less. Uh, her voice can't be heard as she is gradually increasingly silenced uh, until the very end. Then Sukatme asks uh, Rokri uh, what he saw in uh, Damle's house. Rokri says that they were both sitting there. What else did you see? That's all. But I got such a shock sitting there in Damle's room, the night falling. And uh, Rokri is unable to say anything beyond that. Then it is uh, Salman's turn to actually extend Rokri's story and to add on uh, to its details. Right? And remember that Samant is uh, an innocent villager who does not know what's happening. He does not realize the seriousness of the mock court trial. So even though the, the court is being parodied and ridiculed in the process, the uh, very distinction between the outer play and the inner play is completely collapsed. Uh, the charges of infanticide against Miss Benari become real. Right. Even though initially it's supposed to be just a, a mere a theme for the play, uh, in a, then it, later on it actually becomes reality. And there is now no going back that Mrs. Miss Benari has actually been condemned of the offences that she's committed. Salmon says that um, I do hereby swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, true enough for the trial I mean. Of course, what's true for the trial is quite false really, but I'm just taking the oath for practice. Again, uh, Sukha, Sukhatma interrogates Samant, asking him how he knows Ms. Benari. And then Samant says that, initially Samant says that Ms. Benari is a very nice lady. Right? He has a rather favorable impression of Ms. Benari. And later on, again, Sukhatma asks him if he saw Ms. Benari with Professor Damle. And then Samant extends Rokade's story, right? again, making up details. He doesn't realize the seriousness of what he's doing. He does not realize that he is now part of the conspiracy to gang up against Ms. Benare to condemn her and to shame her. And now he says that he, uh, he went to Professor Damle's place to invite him for a lecture. The door was locked, not from outside, from inside, and I banged on the door. No, that's wrong. I rang the bell. The door opened. An unknown man stood before me. Guess who it was? Professor Damle. I was seeing him for the first time. So he'd be unknown to me, wouldn't he? Pongshe, bravo Samant, Mrs. Kashikar. Oh, he's giving his evidence beautifully. 
Samant. Damli was before me. When he saw me, he said with annoyed expression, Yes, whom do you want? Pongshe. He is describing Damle to the life. Samant, I answered. Professor Damle. He said, He is not at home. And he slammed the door shut. For a second, I stood there stunned. I began to think, Should I go home or press the bell once more? Because I had an important errand. Sukhakme what? Samant, what? Well, let's say something. Let's suppose that I wanted to arrange a lecture by Professor Damli. So you notice how he's making up the story as he's telling it. He does lecture, doesn't he? I only ask because he's a professor. So he must lecture at times. So I stood there, wondering how I could go back without arranging the lecture. At that moment, I heard a vague sound from the room, or someone crying. Crying? Yes, an indistinct sound of crying. It was a woman. Sukhatme. Yes? Samant. For a moment, he stood where he was. He means me. He, I mean I, couldn't understand who was crying. You will ask me why I didn't think it was some female member of Professor Damle's family. Well, from the way the woman was crying, she didn't seem to be a member of his family. Why? Because the crying was soft. That is, it was secretive. Now, why would anyone cry secretively in her own house? Thinking over all this, I stood where I was. Just then I heard some words. Mrs. Kashikar, some words. Karnik and Pongshe, who spoke? Samant, you're not supposed to ask. This gentleman, the counsel, you will ask me. Sukhatme, who spoke? Samant, the woman, of course, the one inside. Mrs. Kashikar, good heavens, tell us, do tell us, who was she? Samant, no, he will ask me. The counsel will, not you. Sukhatme, I am asking. Tell us quick, Mr. Samant, what were the words you heard? Don't waste time. Tell us quick. Mr. Samant, be quick. Samant, the words were... Shall I, shall, I, shall I tell it all? Sukhatme, whatever you can remember, but tell us. Samant, if you abandon me in this condition, where shall I go? So he is looking at a book in his hand, he's reading out a line from it. If you abandon me in this condition, where shall I go? Binare is tense. Mrs. Kashigar, is that really what she said? Samant, how can I tell you? Sukhatme, then who or else on earth can? Samant, no, no, I'm telling you the professor's answer. His answer, Professor Damlis. Sukhatme, oh, I see. Samant, where you should go is entirely your problem. I feel great sympathy for you, but I can do nothing. I must protect my reputation. At that, she said, that's all you can talk about, your reputation, how heartless you are. He replied, nature is heartless. So it does not matter whether this event, this uh, illicit relationship actually happened or not. Uh, the entire play really is an imagination of patriarchy. And uh, it's, an, it's, it's patriarchy's imagination of what a woman can do, which is then being read as transgressive, something which, is, uh, which goes against uh, the social codes of uh, chaste femininity. Right? Uh, because the ideals uh, of femininity lie in being a good chaste wife and a good mother. Right? So, so the entire play really is a play on that. I mean, is, uh, whether it really happens or not doesn't matter. It's really a structural problem. Right? The woman is, 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 is potentially guilty for her real or imaginary crimes um, uh, simply because she is capable of uh, acting upon her own sexual agency. About, so she, the fact that she, there's a possibility that a woman may want to choose her own lover, not be married to him, or probably uh, have a child with him. Right? There is something which is being condemned. It's, it's being forbidden. Right? And so Miss Benare uh, feebly tries to defend herself by saying that it's all a lie, a complete lie, but then nobody wants to listen to her because she's already, always already been condemned with the charge. Right? So she's been condemned even before the trial begins. And so Samant fills up the missing details of uh, the story that is begun, that is that that's begun by Rokde, and uh, he imagines that uh, uh, Miss Benare had been uh, jilted and betrayed by Professor Damle, who no longer wants to take care of her once he discovers that um, she has she's bearing his child. So uh, while he she only worshipped his intellect, his mind, uh, she claims that uh, he only he was only interested in her body. He was only interested in you know in, in having fun. Right, and not taking any, any responsibility for the uh, act that he's committed. And so the entire court is shocked when they get to know that Miss, the Professor Damle is the father of the unborn child, uh, which then has to be killed to redeem uh, the woman's reputation and the larger reputation of society itself. And by the end of Act 2, again, uh, Mrs. Ms. Benare is unable to escape from the court because the door has been locked from outside. So you see the second moment where she is symbolically 
trapped within the zone of patriarchy. Again, in Act Three, there's, an, there's a there's a continuation of the mock court trial, and um, you know you also notice by now how Samant has lost all his innocence. Uh, he begins by being a very innocent person, but by now he's been corrupted in the mock court trial by patriarchy, which uh, and whose mechanisms operate through the uh, the institution of the court. And then again, during the the, the interrogation between. Uh, of, of Mrs. Kashgar and, and Kashgar and Mrs. Kashgar, both of them disapprove the fact that uh, Ms. Benare is unmarried at the age of 34. And so therefore, uh, she says that um, she's not less than 34. I'll give it to you in writing. What I say is our society should revive the old custom of child marriage. Marry off the girls before puberty. All this promiscuity will come to a full stop. If anyone has ruined our society, it's Agarkar and Dhondo Keshav Karve. That's my frank opinion. Right? So you have the, the, the voice of the conservative orthodox who believe that uh, child marriage should be brought back because they cannot um, tolerate the possibility of women um, being unmarried in their well into their 30s. And so she thinks that marriage is the only solution to promiscuity. Again, Mrs. Kashigar goes on to say that at her time, whether a girl was snub-nosed, sallow, hunchbacked or anything, she could still get married. It's the sly new fashion of women earning that makes everything go wrong, right? So that's how promiscuity has spread throughout her. Our society is what she says, right? So give women independence, financial independence, emotional independence, and then they become promiscuous, right? So women should not be given any kind of freedom. They should be bound. Their sexuality should be harnessed and domesticated to serve the interests of the family. So again, Mrs. Kashikar, like the other, other characters, is try, trying to closely read Ms. Benare's embodied behavior, right? She seems to be too jolly, too cheerful, right? That itself for her is a suspicious sign of her uh, promiscuity, right? So that she's, uh, she doesn't seem to be bound. She's not, she, her behavior does not show, the way she comports and carries herself does not su su suggest that she is a chaste uh, woman. What's also important to note is that the other male characters, especially Rokade and uh, Sukhatme, suggest that uh, at various points of the th in the third act of the play, suggest that uh, Miss Benare tried to seduce them, uh, and tried to also convince, convince them to get married to her so that her child can have a father. Right? So uh, many of the men uh, in the male characters in the play are uh, secretly uh, desire Miss Benare, right? uh, even though they will not openly acknowledge it. They all want to have some kind of relationship with uh, Miss Benare. Right? So they, they want to, um, in some sense, they are allured by the possibility of, of a woman who is so, uh, uh, you know, uh, free and bold, right? So they're completely, they're very attracted and drawn to a woman who is uh, so uh, sexually bold, uh, seems to be therefore sexually available to them. Uh, but uh, at the same time, they will not be able to, they're not able to uh, associate themselves with her. Uh, none of them will marry her because they, she does not uh, embody uh, the, uh, ideal, uh, the ideal type of a chaste woman, right, of a chaste wife. So there is this paradox, this, this contradiction that operates within patriarchy where all the men in some sense are drawn. I mean, that's the very reason why they actually have a trial on Ms. Benare's uh, alleged infanticide is because they want to participate in a trial which uh, opens up, which dissects uh, Ms. Benare's life as a source of salacious gossip uh, and uh, desire, forbidden desire, right? So, uh, so they all participate in that uh, patriarchal uh, mock trial where they all have a share in uh, dissecting and exposing Miss Benare and humiliating her. And they seem to derive a certain pleasure out of it. Uh, but uh, they also have to maintain a certain distance because they, do not, they cannot be seen uh, being with someone who is not uh, an ideal woman. So at various points in the third act, Pongshe and uh, Rokde uh, suggest that um, Ms. Benare or try to seduce them and try to uh, you know, uh, convince them to get married to her. And then Pongshe discovers that uh, she keeps a bottle of Tick-20, which is a pesticide, in her purse. Right? So they accuse her of having tried to commit suicide. Uh, because of uh, her alleged past, sexual past. So they, they think that, uh, that the fact that she possesses Stick 20 in her purse suggests that she has, she's guilty uh, you know, of having had an illicit affair and for having um, had a child out, out of wedlock. Pongshe said, uh, as, uh, claims that he received a letter from Ms. Benares asking him to meet her. I have some, something to discuss with you. Come at a quarter past one. Wait in the Udupi restaurant just beyond the school. And then Miss Benare uh, Pongshe claims uh, came looking quite guilty.
then she says, Mrs. Uh, then uh, he claims that Ms. Benare could not tell him what uh, she wanted to say in public. So they go to the family room, right? And there um, she opens out the purse to take out a handkerchief. And out of it rolls a, sm a small bottle, a small bottle of Tick 20. And then she Pongsha says that she made known her desire to marry me. Karnik and Kashikar are shocked. They say, what? Kashikar says, this appears terribly interesting, Sukadme. Sukadme, true, my lord, it is and it will be. Did she tell you she was lo in love with you, etc.? Pongshe, no, but she told me she was pregnant. Benare is sitting like a block of stone, drained of color and totally desolate. Karnik, are you telling the truth, Pongshe? Pongshe, what do you think, that I'm lying? Kashikar, who was the father? Continue, Pongshe, continue, don't stop there. Sukadme, Mr. Pongshe, Pongshe, Miss Benare made me promise never to tell anyone the name of the man who had, had made her pregnant. So far, I've kept my word. But who was it? Kashikar, what will you take to shut up? He tells his wife. The cat will be out of the bag soon. And then later on, uh, Pongshe claims that Miss Benare wanted to get married to him. And finally, of course, uh, Pongshe uh, suggests that Professor Damle is actually the father of the child. Karnik and Rokri also suggest that Miss Binare took her turns seducing them to uh, convincing Rokri, for example, to marry her. Right. So there are all these allegations, these uh, that they place on Miss Binare. Right? And so finally, towards the end of the play, uh, Sukhatme, of course, voices is the voice of the court of of legal action of patriarchy. Uh, suggesting that uh, Miss Benari has uh, slandered the very institution of motherhood by having a child outside marriage and has also um, uh, slandered the institution of motherhood by uh, killing the child that she, uh, the unborn child, right? So she has no choice but to kill the child. But if she kills the child, then she is still charged with the um, offense of having, uh, you know, uh, slandered the very institution of motherhood, right? So she has no choice but to be damned and condemned for what she's done. And towards the end, Mrs. Miss Benari's uh, monologue uh, is not really, uh, you know, a, a, an attempt to defend herself, right? Uh, see, she's unable to actually say anything uh, in response to the charges that she, that have been leveled up against her, and she just says that um, she almost seems to be she seems to be talking to herself more than uh, addressing the the court, right? So she says that I have a lot to say for so many years I haven't said a word. Chances came and chances went. Storms raged one after the other about my throat, and there was a wail like death in my heart. But each time I shut my lips tight, I thought no one will understand. No one can understand. When great waves of words came and beat against my lips, how stupid everyone around me. How childish, how silly they all seemed. Even the man I call my own, and so on and so forth. So she really talks about the meaning of life itself. The fact that people take their lives for granted that she was happy, but unfortunately, you know, uh, you realize your the value of life only after you have escaped suicide. In fact, she tries to commit suicide and she, she, she fails, but it's only after she fails that she realizes how much she had taken life for granted. She obviously wants to end her life because of the shame that she's been put through, but then she also realizes that, uh, that you know, she has a very ambiguous relationship to life, really. She has a very ambiguous relationship to her own body because her, bo her body, which has become the embodiment of shame and uh, looseness and, and you know promiscuity and all the charges that are being leveled up against her by society, is the only thing that she really has. Right? Her body is the sign of life. Right? Life is a betrayal. Life is a fraud, she says. Life is a drug. Life is drudgery. Life is something that's nothing or a nothing that's something. And yet life and the body is all that she has. Right? She has nothing else left to live for but to live for herself to live for her own life right and that's exactly what the problem is that even though she she tries to feebly defend herself that she has she's entitled to her own private life she's entitled to her own body and yet she cannot she's unable to escape from the social structure that condemns her to a life of shame and uh, and disrepute right so uh, she it's it's she's really struggling with herself and with her own embodiment that um, she said that this, bo this body is a traitor. I despise this body and I love it. I hate it, but it's all you have in the end, isn't it? It will be there, it will be yours. Where will it go without you? And where will you go if you reject it? Don't be ungrateful. It was your body that once burnt and gave you a moment so beautiful, so blissful, so near to heaven. Have you forgotten? It took you high, high, high above yourself into a place like paradise. Will you deny it? And now it carries within it the witness of that time, a tender little bud 
of what will be the lisping, laughing, dancing little life, my son, my whole existence. I want my body now for him, for him alone. So he, she really wants to live. The only reason for her to live now is for the child, for the life that she's carrying within her body, right? So she, of course, does love the fact that she's, she could become a mother, but now she also realizes that she has no choice but to kill the child. She has been compelled to do it, right? So the very raison d'etre of her existence seems to be lost now because of the of patriarchy, right? And so she um, is condemned, right? So she, she's, she's unable to escape the structure of uh, patriarchy, which condemns her to a life of shame. And yet she has no choice but to embrace it because that's, that is all that she has, right? So towards the end, she's completely silenced. So even though she, there's a long monologue, uh, it does not appear as a successful self-defense of any sort, but it's really more a tussle, a struggle that she has to uh, bear uh, within herself, with herself. Right? So that actually ends our discussion of uh, uh, silence the courts in session. Let us just go over the slides, uh, just to summarize our discussion. So the play describes the, the patriarchal enslavement of women within the space of a court and a mock trial. The court symbolizes a space of patriarchy where Miss Benari is trapped twice. What begins as a mock trial can no longer be distinguished from the actual play within the play by the end. Benari betrays her own crime of bearing an illegitimate child outside marriage and falling in love with a married man named Professor Damle, who never appears on stage despite the fact that he's also responsible. Ms. Benari's songs and poems suggest her own sense of isolation and loneliness. She's accused of being sexually promiscuous on, and of being a disreputable character by the other characters. The male characters of the play, including Sukhatma and Pongshe, wish to have a relationship with a bold woman like her, but end up distancing themselves from her because she does not conform to the ideal of a chaste wife or woman. She is charged with infanticide even before her crime has been determined. She is condemned to be punished and shamed because she has desecrated the institution of marriage and motherhood. Her monologue is hardly a defense against the charges. It is more a conversation with herself about the significance of life and her own desire to live, to be a reputed school teacher. She occasionally ridicules the other characters, who are all struggling and insecure actors, but she's progressively silenced and her voice is usurped by other characters, including Mrs. Kashikar, who's also a participant and beneficiary of patriarchy, even though she's often humiliated and silenced by her own husband. Even Samanth, who's initially an innocent villager and watcher, gets involved in the conspiratorial machinations of patriarchy to trap and victimize a woman for her unconventional life. Ms. Benare claims Professor Damle loved her for her body while she worshipped her in his intel intellect. The other characters like Pongshe and Sukhatme accuse her of trying to seduce them when she wanted a man to love and be a father to her child. Karnik believes she had an affair with her uncle when she was young. Benare has an ambiguous relationship to her body, which is a vehicle for movement and freedom, but also condemned to be stigmatized by others. Thank you.